Okay, here we go. So that's what we will do today. We'll do the art and science of mind hacking. I will speak for about 30 minutes, um, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll leave time for questions. So if you have questions, write them down, okay? And then if you need me to speak slower or explain something, just raise your hand. Um, so, so today we'll go over three major things, really. I will talk about who am I, uh, why am I standing in front of you, what has been my journey and the journey of many people like me. Then what is mind hacking? Um, how do we do mind hacking? And finally, how can we hack ourselves? Hack, rewire, and upgrades our, this tool set here, which is your mind. So first, I'm standing here in front of you. Who am I? First of all, um, I'm a researcher. I spent 10 years in academia, as you can see. I was at various uh, research institutions, originally from Poland, then I was in Spain. I was in New York. I was at Stanford, and then I was back in New York. Then I actually left academia, um, and I became an entrepreneur. And I started working first for other entrepreneurs. In other words, I was working for somebody. Um, and then I started my own companies. And I started a couple companies. As you know, in the startup world, you start, and then you're like, OK, this is not working. Let's pivot. Let's start again. Um, and that taught me a lot of things. And now I mostly work with entrepreneurs. But mostly importantly, I'm a mind hacker. So what we do, as I will talk about it in a second, is we hack the minds. We believe that the human mind is the most untapped natural resource. And, and success really is a mind game that we pay and, it, and place here, the seven inches or 20 centimeters between your ears. And so um, we work a lot with Inc. 500 companies, we work with Fortune 500 companies, any company that understands that the human element is actually one of the major elements and it can make or break, it can make you or it can break you. And so, um, So what is Self Hackathon? Self Hackathon is a company I started in New York City. Um, we are based in New York City and San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And we, we merge three things, science. So all of the experts and all of the people that we work with, um, they're our experts as scientists. Uh, we believe that science has to be domestified in a way. We're trying to make science sexy again. The thing is, we know so much in science already about the human brain, the human psyche, and yet very little comes down to the people. So we take the science, we take the, the natural need of human beings to self-develop, right? Many of us read self-development books and kind of trying to understand how can I be better? How can I understand other people better? So we merge that and then we take technology. So we work a lot with startups, work a lot with tech companies because technology is really where the future is. And uh, at some points, those devices will know more about you than you do yourself because of all the big data stuff and all the clicking and all the liking that you're doing. And so what we're doing is we merge those three and we bridge science, technology, and personal development to hack or and upgrade the brain. So what is mind hacking? Mind hacking works in a similar way. How many, okay, so let's see. How many of you here are programmers? How many, pro okay, perfect. How many people are entrepreneurs? Nice. How many people are aspiring entrepreneurs? One of you. Perfect. Uh, how many of you work for entrepreneurs? In other words, have a job. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. So, um, so th for those of you who are programmers, you know that you first you write the code. And um, human mind is pretty much like a code, and I will explain that in a second. Um, once you write the code, then you write some kind of very initial version. Then you go back and you inspect it. And then you see what are the bugs, where are the things that don't work, where are the things that need to get upgraded, and then you upgrade it. That's why we have you know, version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, etc., etc. Same goes for our mind. This is a mechanism that works as a code that gets programmed at some point. So what you can do is you can go in and inspect that code. Then you can say, OK, what works? I'm, I'm not really happy about it. I want to change that. So there are, what we do, we give you tools to hack your mind. And then you can change and then you can upgrade it. So this is the kind of framework we'll be working with. So let me tell you, um, people say that um, when you give a presentation, people only remember the beginning and the end. Um, so I'm going to give you the most important thing at the beginning and then I'll repeat it at the end. So hopefully you'll remember, okay, if you were to walk away with just three things. The first one is that the human mind is the most important, the most valuable resource there is. If you were to you know, be an alien or anybody looking at the human earth and looking at the earthlings called humans, 
and look into them, you, you would say, they have all those resources, they have water, they have oil, they have gold, but really the most valuable one is here, right? This is, this is the programming that's the most important. And it's also most untapped. We barely ever tap, we look for the resources outside without really understanding how we work ourselves. And really what we're gonna do today is we will understand and inspect the code that is your own code, and we all have our unique code. The second one is that there's something called neuroplasticity, right? You have this resource and it's untapped. And the, with the thing about this research, it, it constantly changes. So we talk about wet, wetware, right? So your hardware, there's software, and this is wetware. So this is gooey thing that's called your brain that constantly kind of works. Even as we speak now, most likely your brain will change in a way because you will hear new information. You will think new thoughts. You will feel new emotions. And that immediately affects your entire nervous system. So the nervous system is this pulsing thing that constantly responds. And the, there used to be this myth that the brain stops reorganizing itself at about 21 years old. It's not true. The brain constantly works. New neural pathways are being created. And so we want to leverage that and we want to take advantage of that. Um, and then finally, the final framework is that every skill, pretty much every human skill, and I can tell you that as a psychologist who worked many years in academia, pretty much every skill is learnable. They're not equally easily learnable, but if you understand the fundamental building blocks, you can pretty much learn anything. Um, that goes for confidence. A lot of people, um, we work with a lot of people around the topic of confidence, emotional intelligence, social intelligence. Those are all skills that you can actually learn. You just have to understand what are the building blocks and then put them in the right order. Sometimes we don't put them in the right order. And so, who's excited for some mind hacking? Okay, excellent, excellent. So what we do today, we will hack the human OS, okay? We will hack the human operating system. So just as your phone has an operating system on which it runs, uh, and my phone was telling me today that it's time to upgrade because I haven't upgraded in a while. Uh, see, the machines tell you when they want to upgrade. Um, we actually know when we want to upgrade also because we keep bumping into barriers in our life. We're like, oh, okay, this is time for an upgrade. And so just as the machine has, a, has an operating system, so do we. And I will talk about what that means and how that works, but just remember that metaphor because it's a very valuable metaphor for a lot of people. A lot of people see psychology as this weird thing. Um, we actually, the metaphor is the human brain as the machine and the human brain as the computer is a metaphor that was introduced by MIT and it still holds, right? So you can think of this system as a, as a computer. So we'll look at three things because we get programmed through three major ways. The first one is the head. Our thoughts, right? What's in our beliefs about ourselves, about other people, and about the entire world. Then the heart, which is the emotions. A lot of us walk around with fear. A lot of us have anxiety, feel a failure. A lot of us have a lot great love. And all this, you know, is all combined in this little heart. All those emotions, they all come pre-installed. And then finally, we're going to look at the body, right? This system here, because the brain is in the body, and we can't really go without... Um, without this body, right? So this body is important and it gets shaped and it, sh it shapes us, others shape us and we shape others as the, as the body speaks. So when you actually run, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have run a marathon in your life? Okay, ex half marathon? Okay, much better. 10K? Good, excellent. O almost everybody is a runner. So uh, when you run, you probably know that the body says, mm -mm, I'm not going any further. And very often it's the brain or is the mindset that says, no, you're gonna push harder. And so um, this is really, you know, we'll be talking about mind hacking, but it really, all this system works together, right? The mind affects the body and the body affects the mind. And you'll see how they kind of talk to each other constantly. So we make this split, which is kind of artificial between the mind and the body. It's one and the same. And actually when you think about the brain, you can also think about your belly because there's all kinds of nerve endings in your belly. That's why people talk about gut feeling because there are actually nerve endings here as big as the fist in your, in your belly. And we'll talk about that, how those two talk to each other, okay? And so let's talk about the head, okay? What's in your head? You guys can talk. Experiences, Experiences. okay. What else is in your head? What is Education, okay. Culture is in your head, okay. Mistakes? 
Oh, instincts. Very good. What else? Emotions. Okay. What is it? Intuition. Okay, excellent. Thoughts, beliefs, culture, values are in our head, right? Pretty much the whole psychological OS of how the world works, who am I, how much am I worth, uh, what do I think about another person, it's all in the head. The research, it's kind of like the software, right? When you think about the apps, you can think of, of the mind as the software. And we have a psychological OS. So I invite you, going back, um, I invite you to turn yourself today as a researcher, okay? Just as you, you can observe this little creature, right? That little frog that looks out, you can observe yourself. Because what happens, we, our creatures are very shy, right? Um, you can, it's hard to catch yourself doing something. So I invite you to become a, a psychologist, if you wish, and kind of look into yourself. So a lot of things I will say will make sense for you, also some things won't make sense, but Treat, treat it as this as a self-research. And so, when you think about the mind, there are certain apps that come pre-installed, right? You buy an iPhone or you buy a Samsung and there are certain apps that come installed. Well, same for us, right? There are certain apps that kind of come pre-installed from our parents, from our culture, from our religion that says, this is what a woman do, this is what a man do, this is you know, this is what love should look like, this is what success looks like, this is what happens when you fail. A lot of those come pre-installed and we see them in the world. And when, I, when we came here from New York, we also looked, you know, how is the culture in this country? What is their operating system, the cultural operating system? And we very quickly learned that you guys, you know, have coffee and croissant and orange juice for breakfast. You don't do that in New York, you know? Um, so this is how we learn. And so some of the apps come pre-installed, but there are other apps that we can actually download, right? When you go to the app store, you look, oh, okay, I need a map of Paris, and then you download that. And so there are a couple apps that I think are very, very important apps to install. And this is mostly the apps that we work on. The first one is confidence, okay? Who here could have a little bit more confidence? <laughs> okay. Yes, many of us, including me. Um, confidence is the power to. Confidence is the, the magical sauce that turns thoughts into actions, right? So first we think thoughts, but that doesn't mean we're going to do anything. Then there's the belief that we can do it and the belief that we'll succeed. And that's confidence. And then we do it with our hands, right? It's that missing link. Confidence is also part of the power to. So the power to do something. Um, and very important part of confidence that few people um, understand is actually self-esteem. Self-esteem is, um, when you think about immune system, right, your body has immune system, this is the immune system of the mind, right? So when you get sick, uh, because it's raining, it was raining all last week, right? Uh, and those of us who have good immune system, we stay healthy, right? And those are who had so-so immune system who were stressed got sick, and there are a lot of people walking sick today in Paris. And so, Self-esteem is this immune system for your mind. So even if people say, well, this is a stupid idea. Um, I don't know how many of you know the Airbnb. And the founders, they got rejected over and over and over again. People would say, they actually published the letters from investors. The investors say, this is the stupidest idea I've ever seen. And so you see that people get rejected over and over again, but they persist. Because their immune system, psychological immune system is strong. The second app that I think is worth installing and downloading and working on is self-compassion. And that's a, it's a soft skill, but it's a very important one. It's how do we deal, how do we think of ourselves? How do we deal with ourselves? And do we have compassion for our mistakes? You know, because the life is, goes up and down, up and down, and it's, it's very complex. How much compassion do we, how, how many times do we have more compassion for others than we have for ourselves? Um, so this is just something to think about. And finally, self-awareness. So. This is the awareness, this is observing you as a researcher and saying, okay, I do this and I do this and I do this. Okay. So, one very quick hack when it comes to the mind for hacking confidence is this very short exercise that I actually want us to do right here, right now, because this is not only about me talking, it's like actually about you doing something. And it goes like this. If you were 10% more confident, what would you do today differently? Okay? If I were 10%, just a little bit more confident today, 
What would you do, not tomorrow, not a week from today, but today? What would you do differently? Or what would you do? Maybe you would talk to somebody that you're, you're afraid to talk to. Maybe you would go and introduce to yourself um, that you want to, always wanted to introduce yourself. Maybe you would send an email that you were afraid to send. Um, or maybe you will speak in a different way or walk in a different way. We will talk about how confidence and how we can hack the mind by using the body. So think about that for a second. What would you do differently today if you were 10% more confident? And the power of this exercise, it's, a, it's called a mental, I don't remember what it's called, mental experiment. It's a psychological experiment, but what happens, it changes you, it starts changing your neural pathways in your brain because you think of different possibilities that exist. Okay? And every time if we think about different possibilities, the brain rewires. And then it wires first on the inside, and then we do things differently on the outside. So the heart. What's in your heart? Feelings. What kind of feelings do we have? Love. OK, excellent. Sadness. Fear. Stress. Emotions, right? Um, you go to any psychologist, everybody has a different definition of what emotions are. We still don't have one solid definition of what emotions are. We, we all feel it. It's hard to mentally describe it, what it is. It's physical sensations. And so for some of us, this is the landscape of our heart, right? It's, there's caves, and it's mountains, and there's valleys, and there's paths. But we overall, we kind of, you know, poised. We can stand in it and we can enjoy the emotional roller coaster. For others of us, this is, this is our emotional landscape. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what's there. We don't understand what's going on with our body and how is it affecting our mind. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the heart right now. Because the heart actually is part of the mind when you think about it. And so... Emotion intelligence is a term coined a long time ago, but mostly popularized by David, Gol uh, David Goleman. Uh, and he says that emotion intelligence is the ability to A, and this is the most important, understand your own emotions, be able to manage them, and regulate them. Okay, so it starts with us, our own emotions. Number two, it's the ability to understand emotions of another people, motivate them, and manage them. And then finally, use this knowledge of those two to manage the relationships. Because I can tell you as social psychologists, somebody who study human beings all over the world, we are social animals. And the biggest programming that happens is the programming from other people, right? The mom, the dad, girlfriend, boyfriend, boss, um, everybody that, that's around us, those are the people who actually program us the most. And this is, you know, the code that we have is very easy to get hacked. And sometimes when you see that, mom says something or husband says something or, you know, daughter says something and you, bye, the reaction is too big, that means they hacked you, okay? So think about the fact that every trigger like that is the ability to rewire. And it shows you something that's in your code that's maybe not working anymore. Or you know that they, you know, they have a way in. And so research also shows that for us, and uh, many of you probably see that, uh, at some point in the career, um, regular intelligence gets us only that far, and then it becomes emotional intelligence. It's about business gets done between people. When you sell your startup, when you pitch your startup, it's, you're not only pitching the startup, you're pitching yourself. And most of the investors actually invest in the people. Um, very often it is the idea fails, but especially in US, the, the VCs and the investors that actually invest in the person, not necessarily in the startup, because they believe in that person. So it's about human to human connection and whether you're able to establish that or not. And so, so we're talking about emotional operating system, okay? There are certain emotions, all of the emotions come pre-installed, okay? And you have, we have the ability to feel it all from the despair and from the fear all the way to the happiness and joy. Um, certain emotions are primary emotions. They all come from the fabric, from the factory. And those six primary emotions are, what are the primary emotions? Anybody knows? Fear, anger, sadness, happiness, disgust, and surprise. And those are six emotions that even if you go to Poland, 
or even if you go to Mozambique, or if you go to Korea, or if you go to Peru, we will be able, even if you, know, you don't speak the language at all, those are the emotions I can see immediately in you. And those are the emotions that children show once they're out of the womb, immediately, right? Those six. But then we get programmed, and then we program different emotions. And the emotions that we add on top of that is shame, okay? Guilt, regret. So those are all more the mental emotions. So just that you know. Um, all those are very important because they're very quick decision making, right? You kick me, I kick you back. Uh, you smile at me, I smile back. There's no much thinking in the emotions. They're very quick decision making devices. But that can be good and that can be bad, right? Um, before coming here, I was very stressed and um, here we go. So this is a very famous quote um, from Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. He was actually in um, a psychiatrist who was in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. And he, as a psychiatrist, he observed what was going on. And this is a very famous quote for him because it kind of captures what I'm talking about here. And he says that between stimulus, right? So there's stimulus. I kick you, I smile at you, I say your idea is stupid or whatever. Between the stimulus and response, there is a space, right? Stimulus, response. I say something, you say something back. In that gap that we have, there is the, um, in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom, right? So between stimulus and response is that gap, and this is the space that we're going to work on. So how do, we, how do we hack emotions? How do we hack the heart? And um, in New York City in February, because it's the month of love, we did an event of Hacking Heart, and it was the, by far the most populated event because every, people don't, we don't really know how to deal with our own emotions, right? We know more or less how to stop thinking about something, but the emotions, they're very hot. They're very, they're very powerful also. For, and for many of us, emotions are like this, right? It's, it's a waterfall. And so... When there is a system hijacked, right? You can think of emotions, when the hot emotions come in, that there's a system hijack. What has happened, there are a couple of things to deal with that. First of all, um, you can name the emotion. That's already a very, very first step, is understanding what's happening, right? So literally saying to yourself, I'm afraid, I'm angry, I'm ashamed, um, I'm anxious, because that already gets, it's almost like the reset in the system. Okay, just, just using the words to name it. The second element is to breathe. You probably have the most portable tool, mind hacking tool with you, which is the human breath. And we kind of forget about it, okay? You can take it anywhere with you, and that's what I was doing here. You probably didn't see that, but I was breathing in a specific way. Um, you can literally reset your system, like control delete everything by breathing, okay? Because what happens, research shows that emotions have a lifespan of 120 seconds, which is what, two minutes, right? So the emotion comes, boop, 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 and then it goes. And then another one comes and goes. So you can see that in children, right? They fluctuate like that. Well, we don't allow those emotions to kind of go like this. We, we stick to it and it goes up. And so one hack that I want to give to you is called square breathing. And it's a, it's a type of breathing that was developed by scientists, but then it's used by um, navies, it's used in army, it's used in many military people, and it goes like this, literally. Um, we can do it together. You breathe in for four, so one, two, three, four. You hold the air at four, one, two, three, four, and then you breathe out, one, two, three, four, and then you hold at the end, one, two, three, four. Okay? And it goes like this. It's called square breathing. And it's a very, very powerful tool to literally start resetting the system. When the system goes crazy, you know, when your computer and you're trying to push something and it's nothing works, uh, and then you're like, shut it down. It doesn't even want to shut down. This is the way to kind of calm it down, okay? So that you can finally start doing something. And then finally, and I think that's very important for a lot of us uh, who are physical. Okay, so fight or flight is when fear comes, and it comes all the time, because fear 
There's no way of getting rid of fear. Fear is the most powerful emotion in the animal kingdom and in the human kingdom, right? If we don't have fear, uh, we probably would not exist here in this world. So fear is very important. It's very powerful. And what fear does is it makes us want to fight or flight. So fight is fighting, literally, right? Men would fight. Girls would fight too. Or we would fly away, which means run away to the, to the safety. And that animal in us wants to fight or it wants to run away. And a lot of people, a lot of scientists say that trauma is when we're not allowed to fight or flight, but we freeze. And we freeze in that in-between state. And so something that I actually, um, I work a lot with very high-level CEOs, um, two things that you can do actually when the fear comes in. So the first one is literally fight, so do something physical with your hands because the hands want to do something, and you will see that the hands want to do something. Boxing is extremely good, okay, boys, boxing. Um, what I did, the other one is flight, which is running, so sprints. So it kinda, it's a biohack that resets your mind and resets your body. So either using the upper body, which is, you know, you can do push-ups, anything that engages the upper body, or sprints and running. That's why I run so much. Uh, so I'm all zen now. Okay. So th this, is, this is the heart. And finally, the body. Right? This system, this hardware that we carry around, in which pretty much, unless we reach... Um, a time where we can download our consciousness onto machines, we're still dealing with the body. And this body is a gigantic communication antenna. It constantly communicates to you, and you communicate to me back. And I can see through your body posture, you know, who's stressed, who's interested, who's not, um, who's really into that, who's a little bit nervous. It's, it's a gigantic antenna. You don't, I don't even have to understand what you're saying, or, you know, I don't have to understand your language, but I will understand what your body is saying. And so... It's the primal code. We get coded by our parents and we get coded by our culture and then in reverse we code others. And it's, the research shows that people who are actually in love or people who have good conversations wouldn't sync up their body movements, right? So if I'm standing this, try it with somebody. Um, try mimicking their body. Um, we naturally do that, right? We naturally start syncing up with other people. And so, the cool thing about the body is that it's also it's a mind hacking tool, right? We can hack our mind by using our body. Our bodies remember. And there is a famous book, um, The Body Keeps the Score, which is about how actually trauma and a lot of things get stuck in the body. So even if we don't remember, mentally, it's still in the body. But not only bad things are in the body. All the good things are also in the body. The body stores pretty much all the memories. So a lot of memories that we're not consciously aware of, they stay in the body. And so what I want to do with you today is give you a little experience of how we can hack the mind by using the body. This is something called priming in psychology. We know that if I gave you words, if you just read words that are associated with being old, okay, you will walk slower. Your body would behave in a way that as, as if it aged. But if I give you words, consciously or unconsciously, to read about being young, your body will behave in a different way. So in other words, we prime associations. Our body remembers different states. And that's the power of the body. Research shows that confidence lives in the body, right? Um, we know that somebody is confident when we see that person on the street. We don't necessarily have to hear what they say, but you know confidence when you see it, right? They walk in a different way. They talk in a different way. They behave in a, they sit in a different way. They stand in a different way. And the research both on animals and human beings is showing us now that confidence has to do with taking space, both body-wise, but also voice-wise. And I don't have time to go into that, but just, just know that. And so a friend of mine, Amy Cuddy, she did research. She's a, at Harvard Business School now. And she did research in her classroom, and then she took it otherwise. She's showing that just taking space is hacking the, with our body, is hacking the mind, telling the mind, OK, you're safe. You're OK. You're a powerful human being. And then other people also perceive us as much more confident. We speak in a different way. The thoughts are different. What she's showing is actually the body is affecting the hormonal system, and what gets produced is testosterone. 
okay? Testosterone is the hormone of the winners. Both men and women have testosterone. Women have less, significantly less, but it, testosterone has to do with risk taking. And so the research on power poses is showing that any pose that actually takes space and puts the chest up, head up, right? So how confident people, and how confident people walk and talk, this is actually sending information through the nerves all the way up to the head saying, you're a confident person. And not only I think I'm a confident person, you probably would think also too. Um, so it's a very powerful by your body mind hack to really work with confidence. I think this is it because I think I'm running out of time. So, so this, is, this was just the surface. Each one of those topics can go, we can go, you know, months and weeks. And in fact, I do two, three day workshops. So what's next? You can either come to New York City where I live, I'm leaving tomorrow, uh, or come to California where we also live. Um, or you can uh, join us online. We are just developing um, a mind hacking app, actually an app that, use, that does personalized mind hacking, uh, which we work with 20 other scientists, and I think this will be the, the very first idea like that, um, where psychology, science, and technology get combined, finally, uh, because there are many apps for many other things except for our own mind, which is kind of sad. And, um, and this, is, this is me. Um, feel free to email me. I won't be, I won't, I'm not sticking around anymore. I'm, I'm going back to New York tomorrow, but I'm happy to answer any questions on email or send you some resources. And also, something I want to end with is the title was The Art and Science of Mind Hacking. And what we do is we bring you science. Everything I talked about is science-based. Ba science but the art belongs to you. And this is the city of the artist. So take the science and make art of it. And, and what I invite you to do is make art of, of, your, of your own life. Because that's really what it is. This, this, especially this city is full of wonders. The world of entrepreneurship. We have the abilities that we have never had before, both men and women, of what we can do. And so, again, the space, really the success takes place here. So just take care of that space, understand it, and, and know that this is rewirable. Um, you know, the, think about just walking away. Think about what version are you on already of yourself, right? Many of you moved beyond version 1.0 a long time ago. Maybe you're at 5, or maybe you're at 50. I don't know. Um, but know that there are many more versions that you can easily tap into. And so I think we're going to leave the time for questions. Ta-da. <laughs> well, what's your favorite pre-programming pre tool? Pre-programming? Yeah. What do you mean by pre-programming? Pre programming tool in sense programming yourself to, to change. Um, well, so with any hacking, you have to understand the code first, right? So what we do is you look for the patterns of behavior. Oh, I always behave the same way with my husband, and I behave differently with other people. So, so the very first one is actually awareness. And I, I don't think it's, I think it's a meta hack. Okay. Once, you know, once you have awareness that this is how I behave, this is what I do, so you have to look at yourself as like anthropologist, you know? Um, it's, get outside of this head and be like, this human being is doing a lot of weird things um, that very often don't make sense, right? Um, but inside our head, it's like, it makes perfect sense. And so I would say awareness, cultivating awareness. And that's why all this new research coming out of all those fields about mindfulness, you know, it's stripped out of religion is the way to observe yourself and be like, well, look at you, you're really doing this, right? Um, so that's a super meta hack is really being aware of that. And then there's, I have so many, I mean. Okay. <laughs> Every single day I have new ones. That's the cool thing about science is we, there's new information coming in every day. You have 200 scientific papers being um, published a day and each one of them has a hack. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what is your idea that depression is the second highest diagnose in the Western, in the Western world? And we live in the most connected society, but yet people are... Feel the most lonely, yeah. But are, f are feeling the most isolated in more psychiatric 
disorders are being are increasing with okay. this new yeah. connection yeah. that we have in technology? I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's multifold. Again, nothing is straightforward. Um, as a psychologist, living in New York City, there, we have a bias towards happiness, clearly, right? Everybody wants to be happy. Um, so you guys didn't hear about my background. Um, I didn't share that. So I first studied genocide, psychology of genocide. Then I studied terrorism. Then I studied um, torture. And then finally I studied shame and guilt, okay? So I studied the dark side of the human nature. And so I think that we disregard this dark side. We, we don't know and we don't want to feel those dark emotions. And I think there is value in every single emotion, including shame, guilt, jealousy. Um, and we have, as society, especially in US, we have a bias for the positive. You know, everybody feels, wants to feel happy. I think you can't feel all the good emotions without feeling the bad emotions. We don't have tools and we're not being taught how to deal with the dark emotions, right? And so what people do, and I see that a lot, um, we numb ourselves. And uh, the way of numbing ourselves is you know, getting addicted to things or blindly just getting rid of any emotion. Because what happens is this system either gets, you either push it down or it gets overactivated. Um, so the idea is to keep it in that healthy range, but being able to go all the way here and all the way here and kind of go and like, explore your emotions because when you really look at, you know, you had all those great writers here in, in Paris, um, for example, people with um, um, bipolar disorders, when you actually look at it, the, it, this is being linked also to creativity, for example, right? So when you go into the depression mode, um, unless it's clinical, you actually, and I, you know, we, people who live in places that have four uh, seasons, we tend to do it in winter, right? We go in, we read books, and it's like we think about the nature, and we get existential, and then spring comes, and we're like, ta-da, I'm going to create now, because we have digested all this information. So, yes, so this is one, one thing. I think some of the stages are natural stages. We, do, we don't really know how to deal with our own humanness anymore. You know, um, second one is we're less, we're more connected and more, we're more connected and more lonely at the same time, right? A lot of us has lost this ability to talk to another human being. Um, go to any restaurant, you can see people sitting next to each other, opposite to each other, texting, right? Um, the ability to connect with another human being is some, something so fundamental and it's so important for our immune, for our immune system, for our health, and I, I talk about it all the time. Um, so it's it's multifold. Just this morning, I read an interesting metaphor about uh, mind hacking. Uh, it said that it was a bit like uh, breaking into, and it will appeal to programmers, breaking into super user mode. So that, uh, and apparently most of the time, uh, one is locked out uh, in simple user mode so that you can't break anything, but you're not aware of much mm -hmm. at the same yeah. time. And uh, mind hacking would be training oneself to, through awareness, breaking into that super user, super user mode and uh, doing interesting things you don't do all the time. So I suppose you agree with that. I agree with that. Um, so just to give you an example of that, we have 70,000 thoughts a day, okay? Beep, 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 beep. This brain just constantly goes on and on and on and on, right? Up to 90% of them are the same, okay? So we keep thinking the same things. We wake up and we're like, oh, it, it snows. Or, oh, it rains. This sucks. I have to go to work. I really hate my work. Oh, I have to make dinner now. What's for dinner? So we keep thinking the same thoughts uh, without really inspecting them. Another thing is 40% of our actions, everyday actions, are habits. We do it automatically, right? When you drive a car, you don't really have to. So most of the time we walk around on autopilot without really inspecting, and that's a good thing because that keeps us you know, alive and everything, but we don't really inspect that. And so when, when psychologists talk about what's conscious and what's not conscious, the amount of consciousness that we have over our life is as much as you can put you know, information you can put on the this, this screen. The unconscious is a NASA supercomputer, okay? Big, big, powerful, and it rules the show. 
But there are tools, as you mentioned, to unlock this, take it out, first of all, with your awareness, take it out and be like, okay, who programmed me, right? Because we all got programmed. And the programming happens very early, right? What did mom say? How was your very first day in school? How was your first love? How was your first heartbreak? Those are all events that program us very early on, right? And then we don't inspect that. We don't say, okay, this was one instance, like, I don't, I don't want this stuff anymore. It doesn't serve me. Um, most of us just, so yeah, I agree, if, if that was the question. A very short yes and no qu question. Is, um, mind hacking, hacking has something to do with NLP? Um, so NLP is, has all kinds of raps. NLP was actually created by psychologists. Um, with any power that you have, you can use it for good and for bad. What we do is we, we relate it much more to the science. So we draw from neuroscience, psychology, anthropology. We have medical doctors that work with us. Um, I would say it's NLP 3.0. Um, do you have hack for procrastination? <laughs> and, uh, or is there any apps already existing? For procrastination? Yes. There are many apps for procrastination. Um, people get motivated either by pain or by pleasure, okay? Uh, usually, the pleasure of procrastinating is much bigger than the pain of not getting something done. So what you can do is you can start playing with the one and the other. Um, and then email me and I can send you a couple more hacks because procrastination is something. Um, there's actually a professor of philosophy at Stanford University. He, he puts it very interestingly. Um, he says that actually for him, procrastination is a way to get other stuff done, right? Because you probably notice that you don't do the major thing, but you get, you get everything else, those little things done. So if you are aware of that, you can strategically put something on the top and then get everything else done. So there are different ways of hacking procrastination. Okay, and here's my last question. Yes. What do you think about, they say that people who are usually creative, like artists, entertainers, entrepreneurs are usually the most psychotic ones. Like what is your, because they were saying that being bipolar or having ADHD is the CEO's profitable disorder. And what is your thoughts on that? Is the more creative or more courageous you are in enterprise, usually the more psychotic you are in your personal life? Yeah, so um, very recent book by Adam Grant, who is a professor of Wharton, uh, Wharton Business School, at UPenn, he actually says that um, what happens, for example, most of the Nobel Prize winners in sciences are not only scientists. Very few of them are strictly scientists who just sit and like do their work. Most of them are actually people of many talents. So many of them play music. Many of them are magicians. Uh, many of them paint or play. So in other words, the genius is, the research shows the genius is not only being focused on one thing, but actually the genius is collaborations of many things. And people with HD, such as myself and many other people, we just gather a lot of information. Um, and what happens is talking about the unconscious, the unconscious processes it, right? What we can process consciously is so, 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 so tiny. Most of the stuff gets processed in the unconscious. So the more information you can take, the more it gets processed. Um, yeah, yes. Um, so, so this is not necess necessarily a question, but a comment. Um, a lot of what you spoke um, is what uh, yoga practices mm. are, are all about. And uh, I mean, I'm just making this comment as a recommendation to the audience in terms of um, researching mm -hmm. and starting to practice some of the, the yogic practices, um, especially to the comment about uh, flight or fight. Uh, so instead of running, yoga actually helps you to stand still, to balance yourself in a confident manner to be able to face up to reality and the reality of the moment. Yeah. I so I, I, would, I would very highly recommend to the people who are here uh, to, to research and try out some of those things. Just for many of us um, who are entrepreneurs, just any physical movement, uh, we get so stuck in the head. Um, the head st keeps spinning so that if you can get out of the body, and I know with you know, either pitching or working a lot, it's hard to but it's so valuable. And 
Research shows that not exercising is like taking a depressant, to your, also to your point. Um, it literally is like taking the present. It's not that exercise is like take an antidepressant. Not exercising is like taking a depressant. So just keep that in mind as you know, as it's raining and the days are short. Um, in my work, I have to help a lot of people, and I can see that a lot of people they like to complain. So is it satisfactory? Does it have any personal or social use? <laughs> Complaining. It does. Yeah. yeah, of course. Pretty much everything we do, <laughs> it's a genius program, right? It does something. Um, so complaining actually, it, so I'm from Poland. We, in Poland, we complain a lot. And that's a lot. Um, but that's a way of kind of establishing the ground with another human being. So I complain, and you say, how are you doing? Oh, horrible. No, no, but like my life is even worse than yours. Um, and that's in a malicious way, in a weird way, it's a way of bonding together, right? If I go to Poland, and I had those cases, you know, I've been out of Europe for 10 years, and I go back to Poland, and I say, things are great, and they look at me, and they're like, what's wrong with you, right? Because it's, you break their code, like, you're not supposed to say things are good, you're supposed to say, oh, no, no, it sucks, I mean, it's, yes, it's sunny, but it's going to rain tomorrow, probably. Um, it's a social code, right? And some of us get programmed like that. Um, so every emotion, I would say also every emotion, every, just observe yourself because everything we do makes sense. It's a survival mechanism. This system got programmed to survive. And so just to answer, somebody asked me, I don't remember who asked that, um, something about jealousy. Jealousy is a great emotion to observe, okay? Who, who here doesn't feel jealousy? You don't know? Who feels jealousy? Okay. So jealousy is an emotion that actually lets you know what you want in life, right? Um, it's, so pay attention to what you're jealous about because this is what you want, right? So it's your emotions telling you, well, I want this too. Like, why, why don't I have this yet? And so observe yourself as this researcher and pay attention to all those emotions. Where is anger coming from? Where is shame coming from? Shame is something I study a lot because it's so complex, but it's also an emotion that sends us information. And so um, complaining, it serves a tool, right? People wouldn't be complaining if it didn't do something for them. And so what I invite you to do is observe, or even ask them, you know, what, what happens when they complain? Yeah? OK. So I'm going to stick around. Um, if you have questions, it's been an honor and pleasure. Again, merci beaucoup. And, uh, <laughs>